This is an NJN News special report. Governor Whitman's budget message to the state legislature. Hello, I'm Kent Manahan. Welcome to NJN's coverage of Governor Whitman's 1999 budget message to the state legislature. Almost two weeks ago, the governor laid out her agenda for the next year in her State of the State address, including a homestead rebate program aimed at easing property tax burdens. Today, New Jerseyans get a look at the details on how the governor will implement the program she's calling for. A joint session of the state legislature has gathered in the assembly chambers at the State House in Trenton. Our NJN senior political correspondent Michael Aaron is standing by at the State House with a preview. Michael, I guess today we get to find out how the governor will pay for what she wants. Well, that's going to be easy, Kent, because the state is anticipating $900 million more in revenue in the next budget year than in the current year. And on top of that, we're going to get some tobacco settlement money, at least $92 million right off, another $240 million. So this is a no pain budget, as it's being called. Most of the attention so far has been drawn to the property tax relief uh, piece of the budget. As you said, the governor did unveil the rebate plan in her State of the State address. There's $200 million budgeted for that in the next fiscal year so that residents, homeowners, will see an average of $120 in rebates sometime around Labor Day. On top of that, the governor's staff is touting the other property tax relief elements in this budget. The fact that school aid is up by $317 million, municipal aid up by $23 million to $1.6 billion. On the other hand, uh, mayors are saying, well, $23 million uh, increase in municipal aid isn't even enough to offset the rise in our local pension costs for police and firefighter pensions. Those are set to go up about $31 million statewide. And there is uh, some question about whether this $200 million in property tax relief will mean a lot to citizens because already in 1998, as a news report pointed out this morning, property taxes statewide increased by well over $400 million. They'll, they're likely to do that again uh, in 1999. So there will be debate as to whether this amount of property tax relief, which the governor's staff pegs at about $800 million, is really going to be felt by the people of New Jersey. We are uh, awaiting the governor's arrival. The speaker is gaveling uh, the chamber to order but I will toss it back to you until the governor arrives. Michael, a question. You attended a briefing uh, on the budget on Saturday with other reporters. Give us a brief idea of, of what attracted the most attention during that briefing. Well, I would say that the governor's staff, which conducted the briefing, uh, highlighted the property tax relief piece, which I just explained. The reporters were more interested in the tobacco settlement money um, and whether it is really going to what the governor said it would go to. Uh, when the state agreed to accept the settlement about six weeks ago, the governor said all of that money should go to health-related programs. And uh, there's some question that there is some question as to whether that's actually going to happen, but I'm going to toss it back to you now, Ken. All right, Michael, thank you. And of course, we'll rejoin you shortly when the governor does arrive. The state legislature is likely to make some changes in the governor's budget plan. I'm joined now by NJN's two political analysts, Republican Roger Bodman and Democrat Jim McQueenie. And Jim, sounds like the governor's budget is kind of a no pain message. Would you agree? Oh, I think you have to agree here. It's amazing what a, what a windfall from heaven can do in terms of uh, uh, a good national economy and what it brings down to the states. Uh, you're basically talking about buckets of uh, surplus and, and money here in, in, in all candor. That uh, I'll tell you, nothing like that. Uh, bipartisan uh, agreement and, uh, in Trenton is never greater than when you have lots such abundant money. resources mm. like this. So well, nobody's lots, fighting over the watering hole on this one, in this process. Lots that, of revenue from uh, tax receipts, much more than the state had anticipated, and of course this tobacco settlement, which Michael was talking about. So the state is kind of awash in money, if you will, Roger. But there are some people who are still not satisfied in this budget. Michael spoke uh, a little bit about the concern from urban mayors that mm -hmm. the money mm -hmm. that they will get, 
the increase that they will get will not even be enough to offset the, the pension increases they have to pay for for police and firefighters. Well, you know, the governor uh, said right up front uh, when she announced uh, this uh, property tax relief program, and it's important to, to make the differentiation uh, between relief and reform, and she has uh, very emphatically over the last number of days and will continue to do so in this speech, Kent, and that is, is that this program is designed to be relief, give some money directly back to the people that pay those very high property taxes. Reform is a whole other issue, and she has been very courageous, and she again continues in this speech talking about the 1,600 plus local entities of government we have in this state, the 711 school, 611, excuse me, school districts we have, uh, some 23 of which don't have any schools, and she, she questions the need for this and, and, and does properly say that some of the role for responsibility for, for, for setting these taxes is in fact at the, at the local level. She's said many times that she does not raise the property tax, she does not spend the property tax, and she's trying to instill some fiscal responsibility at that level. Well, certainly the property tax uh, issue and the governor's plan has, has really garnered the most attention from the state of the state message and, and as we move on now to the budget address today. The Democrats say they're satisfied, Jim, but they're, they also say, which is what the governor said, that there is a real need for long-term reform. Uh, for property, for real property tax relief. Oh, very much so. And if anybody could ever get a book it, called Municipal Madness by the former Democratic Assembly Speaker Alan Karcher, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's just out. It's a wonderful book that talks about this problem. It's a big problem. It'll have to be solved in a bipartisan way. I, and I think the governor's tax commission, uh, where she studied this, unfortunately just studied it and really didn't come out with much. But it really has to be bitten into because it is the root of problems in, in property tax reform. I think Democrats and Republicans admit this. One point that Roger raised about the, uh, the mayors of cities not being addressed in this budget. I think it is a big political concern, by the way, for Republicans and Democrats because uh, cities typically say in periods of want, certainly not today, they say, okay, we can understand things are so tight we can't get help now. But in periods of plenty like now, well, how do you answer them if you didn't give it to them when you didn't have it? But Jim, she is in fact addressing them. I and mean, there's a, a portion of this speech that she will address uh, urban needs. Uh, she's certainly sensitive to those needs. You know, but, but again, the fact remains is that, that and she provides for for incentives for consolidation of services. I mean, as you say, it is a very difficult problem. Our love affair with home rule in the state of New Jersey has been longstanding, and and it's very difficult to break that down. So she's trying in this budget to provide incentives for those municipalities that consolidate services, whether it be they police or fire or whatever. And uh, I think that's the right approach. It is a very difficult political problem given that long-term love affair with home rule that we've had in New Jersey. But uh, she's certainly making well, an effort. Well, this has been talked about for eons in New Jersey. This governor has has really prioritized it in her administration in terms of speaking about it and now maybe we are seeing some incentives for municipalities to begin to share services. She singles out those who do in Bergen County and the success that they have with firefighting and police services. Uh, is, is that a, a real possibility? This is an election year. We're certainly not going to see anything move in that direction in this year. Well, but Ken, I think it is a real possibility and I think you see at the grassroots level common sense. I come from Bergen County. Every traffic light, uh, it seems like every little town has one traffic light and therefore qualify to have a police chief with four uh, uh, people under them in every town. Well, you think regionalization would really play here to uh, reduce the property taxes, um, and it would. But it's more than that. It's more than money. It's also policy. For instance, uh, outside of Trenton here, a very big dispute. Merrill Lynch wants to relocate its headquarters to a suburban area. Uh, the governor has policy ability to. She can say, build in cities. That's where offices should be. The subur suburbs need uh, more of these gargantuan suburban office complexes or strip malls. And that's where the governor, as a governor, can be very effective in enforcing uh, um, basically zoning regulations and, and, and construction and offering regulations those incentives. and offering incentives to them which is different than whatever property tax rates are. I think a lot of people in New Jersey are getting very discouraged about uh, this pursuit of property tax offsets by having to bring in big corporations or uh, developments like that in suburban but, areas. But it takes away from the integrity fairness of the to this governor, She has done probably more than any in terms of the so-called state plan which is which is the master plan for state growth and, and so forth and, and, and she's really promoted that. She's also promoted obviously her own and space program, which is really the cornerstone of, of, of her 1998 agenda, of, of which he was tremendously successful. This budget starts to address some of the first uh, areas of responsibility that come uh, in in that area. Uh, but uh, the, she will move forward on on, prop, on open space uh, her open space program this year. So I think think to to chastise her is frankly unfair. The fact is she she's looked at the at the master plan of the state, the so-called state plan, and she's also obviously addressed the open space needs of the state very in a very significant way. All of which we're going to hear more 
more about in the budget message when we go back to the assembly chamber, which I understand is due to get underway shortly, I'm hearing uh, from my producer. But in, in the meantime, we, I said this is an election year. Every year is an election year in New Jersey, but this is an assembly election year, exactly. and the full uh, assembly is up for re-election in November. Um, that's pretty good news for the Republicans it's who have control news. of the assembly uh, when the state is awash in so much cash. And none, and none happier than Speaker Jack Collins, who is right. the real proponent of this property okay. tax rebate program. Roger, I have to interrupt you because we are going to go now to Michael. The governor has entered the assembly chambers to deliver her budget message. We rejoin Michael Aaron at the State House. Michael? Ken, we just had a uh, stirring hymn from a gospel choir. Actually, it was a rendering of America the Beautiful. Uh, that produced a standing ovation here. The assembly speaker has just asked that the governor be escorted into the chamber. Uh, the legislators are rising. And here they come, Assemblyman Lou Romano, Assemblywoman Nia Gill, Governor Whitman, Senator Bernard Kennedy, Assemblyman Gary Schooltrager. That's Nia Gill walking past you from Essex County, Bernard Kennedy. The governor greets the Senate President and the Assembly Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of New Jersey, the Honorable Christine Todd Whitman. Do it again. Okay. Now we can start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the legislature. We meet today in the People's House to fund the people's priorities. Our economy is strong, 325,000 jobs stronger than when I took office. What's more, our revenues have grown along with our economy. Our fiscal strength might tempt us to loosen the purse strings. As a wise person once said, prosperity is a time when people buy things they can't afford. But I would argue that prosperity is the time to be even more careful with the taxpayer's money. Members of the legislature, as I said in my State of the State address, we must put the people first. We must recognize that fiscal discipline is the only way that we can provide substantial tax relief to the homeowners of New Jersey. So before I say a single word about the details of my budget proposal, let me state right up front, property tax relief must be the highest priority of this legislative session. So let's get this done. Let's show the taxpayers we mean what we say. Mayors and taxpayers groups support our billion dollar property tax relief plan. Homeowners struggling with high property tax bills support it. And I'm glad to say that members from both sides of the aisle have voiced approval. We are in agreement, not only with each other, but with the writer Dorothy Parker who once stated, that the two most beautiful words in the English language are check enclosed. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of keeping promises, let me send a word to our auto insurance companies. 
This governor and this legislature are going to hold you to the promise we made last year. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. You must save good drivers a full 15%. Ladies and gentlemen, the $19.2 billion budget I am proposing today is balanced, responsible, and ambitious. Once again, it lowers our structural deficit. And with this budget, our six-year average growth rate is lower than that of any administration in at least the last three decades. In government, the bus budget is the message, and our message is clear we have our priorities straight. As I will discuss today, this proposed budget invests in our schools and helps keep college affordable. It promotes the health and safety of our young people. It helps our cities achieve their enormous potential, and it moves people off the welfare rolls. It improves our roads and bridges, and it expands our commitment to law and order with new investments in police, prosecution, and parole. But that's not all this spending plan accomplishes. It also fulfills our commitment to provide more support to seniors and caregivers. It also allows community providers to keep up with the cost of living. It increases our capital budget by more than 15% to meet such vital goals as clean water and well-maintained parks. It sets aside three quarters of a billion dollar surplus, which includes a record amount in our rainy day fund and it returns to the taxpayers that which is rightfully theirs. In fact, with your help, this budget will return $577 million more to the communities of this state. More school aid, more municipal aid, and most important, this increase includes over $220 million in direct relief to our homeowners. We're making an historic commitment to property taxpayers in this budget, but I want to be clear. It is not simply enough to provide property tax relief. We must do all we can to promote property tax reform. Property tax relief will demand hard choices here in these chambers. Property tax reform will demand hard choices in every municipal building and city hall at every school board and fire district meeting. The people of our state must take part in that process. Our citizens should be asking why New Jersey, the most densely populated state in the nation, spends more than any other state to bus a child to school. Citizens should ask, does New Jersey really need 1,600 separate units of local government? Why is it that one New Jersey county has less land and one-ninth the population of New York City, but has more fire trucks than all of the Big Apple? Should we really have more than 600 school districts when we don't even have that many towns in the state? And why on earth do we still have 23 school districts that don't even have a single school? Real reform is going to require real tough choices at the local level. <coughs> So having said that, let me give you an idea of what I mean. Why don't we fix our fragmented and inconsistent system of property tax assessment, which forces some homeowners to pay more than their fair share? Why don't we act on a property tax commission recommendation and move property assessment from the municipal level to the county level? And let's have the state pay the freight. I know that some people will want to maintain the status quo because they benefit from it, but this proposed reform would make the system more efficient, more equitable, and save money in every town. 
New Jersey taxpayers, if that's the kind of reform that makes sense to you, then get involved. Show up for your town council and school board meetings. Make a point to vote in your local elections. Support your elected officials when they call for consolidating services and demand that they stretch your tax dollars as far as possible. Mayors need all the support they can get. Take, for example, the Hudson County mayors who decided to merge their fire services. Instead of widespread acclaim, they faced organized pickets at their homes, personal attacks, and full-page newspaper ads criticizing their plan. These courageous mayors met that opposition head on, and they created a new fire service that will be even more efficient and save the taxpayers millions of dollars each year. I want to acknowledge them today. Mayor Albio Ceres of West New York, Mayor Nicholas Sacco of North Bergen, Mayor Richard Turner of Weehawken, and Mayor Rudy Garcia of Union City. These mayors are doing their part. And with the legislature's approval, the state will do its part, with up to $35 million in incentives from the REAP and READY programs championed by Assemblyman Leonard Lance, Paul Kramer, Scott Garrett, and Joe Roberts. It's time to start handing out aid as a reward for doing the right thing to promote government reform. So this budget makes REAP and READY the bulk of new state aid to local governments. As we do that, I also support propose that we scale back discretionary aid and transform it into what we're calling extraordinary aid. This $20 million account will be used to help mayors and towns facing catastrophic events and true emergencies. Reap and Ready will reward municipalities for sharing services, or for that matter, even planning for consolidation. Best of all, homeowners will see the aid from Reap as a direct credit on their property tax bill. Mayors of New Jersey, I challenge you to replete our REAP and ready, deplete our REAP and ready funds. I promise to replace the money as soon as you do. I also call on every citizen to give reform a chance. The next time your mayor or school board suggests a way that can cut costs and save tax dollars, hear them out. The money you save will be your own. You have already made your voice heard on an issue of tremendous importance. Last November, you said yes to land preservation. With this budget, we continue our journey toward one million acres. Today, I make good on my proposal that as part of the stable source, we make a 10-year, $100 million commitment to park development in our cities and all around the Garden State. In fiscal year 2000, we will tap the first $10 million of that commitment. We will also spend an additional $3.5 million to hire 100 more park rangers and maintenance staff at our state parks, forests, and recreation areas. What's more, I've included $12.4 million for renovating buildings and constructing new facilities at our state parks. If anyone doubts that the people of our state are dedicated to the Million Acre Preservation Goal, just stay tuned. It's only been two weeks since I announced the Garden State Open Space Registry, and already two corporations have contacted us about preserving their land. And let me read you this letter that I received earlier this month from Al Pramick of Teaneck. He wrote, Dear Governor Whitman, 
your admirer in his 90s, is most interested in your noble project to keep our state green. Enclosed is my check for $100 toward the implementation of your plan. Mr. Premick couldn't be here today, but I do want to thank him publicly for his donation. As you see, citizens and corporations are already stepping up to the plate on preservation. Now we should do more to encourage land donations from another key player, our communities. With this budget, we will give cities and towns added reason to help preserve open space by including an additional $2.2 million in payment in lieu of taxes. These checks will offset more of the money towns sacrifice in property tax revenues when land is preserved for state parks or wildlife areas. As you know, we fought hard for another New Jersey treasure, Ellis Island. Let's Let's fight just as hard to make it the showcase America deserves. Our capital budget sets aside $2 million for us to work with the National Park Service and private donors to stabilize and restore badly neglected buildings on this gateway to America. Just as we accept the challenge of helping restore Ellis Island to glory, we continue to revitalize our cities as a priority. We in New Jersey invest heavily in our cities. As you know, my administration set up an Urban Coordinating Council four years ago that is now working in partnership with 16 communities around the state to chart a better future. What's more, last year alone, our development agencies committed over $1 billion in various forms of aid to our cities. We call our approach the Urban Toolkit, an effort to chisel away at the problems that keep our cities from reaching their potential. We've made it easier to convert polluted industrial sites to productive use. We're moving full speed ahead with our $400 million urban redevelopment program that converts boarded up eyesores and vacant lots into new homes and businesses. We've helped thousands of urban families become homeowners. Our faith-based initiative is giving community groups around New Jersey the technical and financial help they need to improve their neighborhoods. Why does all this matter? Clearly. To the people of our cities, it means a better life. But strong cities are important to all of us. If our cities fail, we all pay for it, no matter where we live. It's just good economic sense to make them safe, productive, and prosperous. We need to take stock of our effort. We need to know where we stand and what we can do better. I want to hear from those who lead our cities from mayors and police chiefs to superintendents and nonprofit providers. I want to consult community stakeholders and statewide urban leaders as well. So I am pleased to announce that this year I will convene a Governor's Urban Summit. This summit will focus on answering these questions. How can we build on our successes and improve the partnership embodied in our urban agenda? What's more, how can we make even better use of state resources to help our cities. And while we're doing that, I propose we add two more programs to our Urban Toolkit. They are based on a long-held belief in the strength of a diversified neighborhood. Attracting all income groups to our cities in turn encourages restaurants, theaters, and stores to locate there. That way, a neighborhood becomes not just a collection of homes, but a community where people have a stake in making the city safe and inviting for everyone. The first new tool is our Downtown Living Initiative. With $7.5 million, we will offer low-interest loans to help developers reintroduce middle-income households to urban neighborhoods. We've already seen what this can do for our cities. In New Brunswick's Hiram Market area and Morristown's Chancery Square, we've recently helped more than 200 families by building some of the first market-rate rental housing these communities have seen since the 1970s. These efforts are helping people rediscover the excitement and convenience of city life while boosting the urban economy. 
We're also going to steal an idea from the University of Pennsylvania, where they offer incentives for faculty and staff to live near the school. This is helping revitalize West Philadelphia and fill the gap between the school and its neighborhood. New Jersey's urban campuses are already rethinking their relationship to the neighborhoods that surround them. Working together, we can help them. I propose we invest $2.5 million in a special homeowners fund to help faculty or staff members locate and target areas around our urban public colleges and universities in the Garden State. Let's make our cities not only great places to visit, but also great places to live and learn. Let's also continue to make them and every community safer. We can be proud of our record on crime. Today, we're putting more dangerous criminals behind bars and for longer periods of time. But we must remain vigilant about supporting the dedicated men and women at every step of the criminal justice system, from the cop on the beat to the county prosecutor, from the corrections officer to the parole officer. Together, with this budget, we will do just that. For example, we know that prosecutors have hesitated to conduct the DNA testing that can crack a case wide open because they can't afford it. We need to make it easier for prosecutors to make their case, and with this budget, we will. I am proposing that for the first time, we help our county prosecutors by picking up the cost of all necessary DNA testing. This budget will also pay for random testing to enforce a policy that we can all support, zero tolerance for drugs in our prisons. What's more, it will allow us to add parole officers around the state to keep a, to keep a close watch on the most high-risk cases. You've heard me say this before, but I believe that no state in the country has the talent and commitment that our state troopers bring to their jobs every single day. To replenish their ranks and keep our citizens safe, we will train another state police contingent of 100 candidates in fiscal year 2000. As I announced last month, we will hold two classes of 50 every year and ratchet up our efforts to make sure our force reflects the population of New Jersey. We also need to address a problem every parent and every teacher fears, and too many have to face, young people who turn violent. We already have round-the-clock crisis intervention units in every county as part of the family court system. They do a great job of stabilizing flare-ups between youngsters and their families and help them find long-term counseling. They can talk a troubled teen out of a mistake they will soon regret. Let's make the most of this asset. Let's amend state statutes to extend the jurisdiction of crisis intervention units to include children deemed at risk of violence. And let's provide funds in this budget to help these crisis units gear up for the expanded role that they will play. That's not all we need to do. A sad truth about youth violence is that today's victim is more likely to become tomorrow's perpetrator. So today, I am proposing funding to train trauma center staffs and emergency medical technicians to get young victims the counseling they need as quickly as possible. I recommend we also include funds to allow the Commission to deter criminal activity to launch a prevention campaign aimed at helping young people steer clear of violent behavior. We're fortunate to have with us today Commission Member Joe Piscopo, who will use his talents to help raise public awareness about this important issue. Thank you, Joe, and he's got considerable time. Thank you. <laughs> we need 
need to respond to the warning signs of youth violence. We also need to heed another kind of warning sign, the sign that's on the side of every cigarette pack. We know that every year more than 30,000 young people in New Jersey take up smoking. Why do they start? Some of it's peer pressure, some of it's risk taking, but a lot of it is the powerful media messages they get from the tobacco industry. Late last year, New Jersey joined with other states in settling a multi-billion dollar lawsuit against the major tobacco companies. We were among the first states to wage that lawsuit. We got involved to recover taxpayers' dollars that have been spent over the years on smoking-related illnesses. We must make absolutely certain that we spend those dollars on health-related programs. With this budget, I propose using more than $46 million in tobacco settlement funds to create new initiatives and to significantly expand upon current ones. We will, for example, increase cancer detection and screening amongst minorities and give seniors and caregivers more choices for long-term care. We owe it to those who died as a result of their addiction to cigarettes to prevent as many of our citizens, especially our kids, from meeting the same horrible fate. So let's dedicate a substantial portion of the settlement funds for education, treatment, and research. I am pleased to propose that we invest $18.6 million this year in tobacco control efforts, including our youth anti-smoking awareness campaign. We may have retired Joe Camel to the desert, but the tobacco companies haven't deserted their attack on impressionable young minds. This campaign will combat their attack with messages that encourage youngsters to stay away from cigarettes, or if they're already smoking, to quit the habit. One young person here today with us has already heard the message. Her name is Lauren McAtee, and she's a seventh grader at the North Arlington Middle School. She won an award in our essay contest last year on why smoking stinks, and I've asked her to read from that essay today. Lauren? Thank you, Governor Whitman. Why Smoking Stinks by Lauren McIntyre. I watched my grandpa suffer and die because of smoking. He had emphysema. He smoked prayer for about 40 years. You're probably thinking that if it takes 40 years, I'll be fine. I'll smoke now and quit later. It's not that easy. After one cigarette, you can be addicted. Cigarettes can cause tongue cancer, mouth cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, emphysema, etc. Are you a smoking athlete? If so, choose one, because if you smoke while you play a sport, you get out of breath, tired quickly, your overall abil ability starts to fail, all because of a couple of cigarettes. If you buy one pack a day, costing $3.65 for one year, you would spend $1,332.25. You could buy a used car, a big screen TV, dogs, or go, or go on a vacation. Secondhand smoke is worse for you than others because when a smoker smokes, what he or she is taken in is filtered. When a person that is in the same room takes in smoke, they are not only getting unfiltered smoke, but are also getting bad things that are in the air. Did you ever wonder why you can't smoke in museums? Well, the answer is because the nicotine lies on things. Would you like to look at a Picasso painting with layers of brown dust that sticks? I don't think so. I intend not to smoke. I think it is a disgusting habit, and lawmakers should be more assertive on selling cigarettes to minors.
Thank you, Lauren, and good job. You did a great job. Lauren summed up uh, my attitude precisely. We need to be a lot more assertive about attacking the problem. Let's give tobacco the hook before they hook our kids on tobacco. And while we're at it, I want to applaud the folks at Rock Ridge Pharmacy in Glen Rock who decided last week to stop selling cigarettes altogether. As the pharmacy owner, Matthew Kapaki, put it, it's just not right to be supporting an addiction that is killing people. As you know, in few... I think they deserve a clap. As you know, in future years, our state will be receiving about $300 million annually in tobacco settlement funds. We have an obligation to be accountable and to accomplish something meaningful to improve the health of our citizens. I know that many legislators have good ideas about how we use these funds, and I look forward to working with all of you to establish a framework that focuses on the health of our families, especially our children. Let me tell you how I think we ought to use this money. I propose we put together a long-term plan for using tobacco settlement funds to improve children's health in our cities. Research tells us that the first months of life are critical to a child's long-term development. So we will work with the Association for Children of New Jersey to help city ta cities target improvements in three vital categories, prenatal care, low birth weight, and infant survival. And let's also use this money to address another critical health need. Last year, I met with mothers in Camden County who told me that in their part of the state, the only way a teenager can get real help overcoming a drug problem is to commit a crime. That has to change, and it will. Soon, with federal block grant and county support, we will be able to open South Jersey's first long-term drug treatment center for adolescents. I look forward to working with Senator John Matheson, who has been such an effective advocate in this area. <laughs> but this is just a start. I propose that we expand service not only at this center, but across the state as a major focus of our tobacco settlement funds. Around the country, states are grappling with how to spend their windfall. Let's work together to set a national standard for using those dollars for the right purpose. Let's give our kids a healthier start. All our young people deserve that and more. They ought to be able to grow up in a welcoming neighborhood. They deserve good schools and safe places to play. And we all benefit when their parents have good jobs and the hopes for a bright future. That's why we can be proud that more New Jerseyans are working than ever before and that we've seen the welfare caseload plummet 45% since I took office. But even with this remarkable record, some people continue to make welfare a way of life. We need to get them off the welfare rolls forever. This budget initiates what we call the 21st Century Community Partnership. With state funds, community-based organizations in Newark, New Brunswick, Trenton, Camden, and Jersey City will help hard-to-place welfare recipients tackle the problems that stand between them and a full-time job. With this project, we're giving community groups more control and decision-making power. Why? Because they're the closest to the problem and because they know what will work best from city to city. With this budget, we will also provide state matching funds for a $34 million welfare-to-work initiative that will reach the thousands of people who've been on welfare the longest. It will also make sure that non-custodial parents find a job and pay child support. Mm. 
With programs like these, we're taking aim at recipients who have made the public dole their lifestyle. It's time to replace their welfare check with a paycheck. We want to help improve the lifestyle of another important part of the New Jersey family, people with developmental disabilities. We can take great pride that working together, we have met the needs of every single person with a developmental disability who was on the urgent, urgent waiting list for community placement when I took office. In fact, we have made twice as many placements as any previous administration. While closing institutions was not a popular decision, I believe it was the right one. But I'd like you to hear that from someone closer to the issue. Lee Wider's son, Michael, is 41 years old. When Michael was seven, Lee placed him in an institution. As tough a decision as that was, Mr. Wider had even, was even more troubled when he heard that the Princeton Developmental Center was closing. He became one of many opponents of the closure. As Lee put it, I responded with stark, raving fear. I said he would never make it. Today, Michael lives in a group home in Brick operated by the Ark, and both he and his father couldn't be happier. Michael is busy and thriving with a social life that includes dances at the Ark every Friday night. And after putting 5,000 extra miles a year on his car, visiting his son for the last three decades, Lee Wider is now only 10 minutes away. As Lee said, he used to follow me all around and not leave my side. Now I stop in at the dances, and when Michael sees me, he gives me a little peck on the cheek, and then he's off. I underestimated Michael. He does things I never thought he could do. Lee Wider is with us today, and I want to thank him for sharing his story. Thank you very much. We need to generate more success stories like this. So with this budget proposal, this budget proposal includes $15 million to create 500 new residential and 400 new adult care placements. This is the second installment in our plan to end the waiting list by the year 2008. Moreover, this budget provides new family support funding to help families care for their loved ones at home rather than in a residential setting. And it allows us to hire more case managers to give people with disabilities the help they need to move into community residences. Let me take a moment to acknowledge, sir, acknowledge Senators Lou Bassano and Tony Bucco and Assemblyman Mel Cottrell, who have been such staunch advocates for people with developmental disabilities. <clears throat> As we have just shown, budgets are about meeting the needs of individuals and families, but they are also about addressing the priorities of our state, and in particular, our need to maintain a strong economy. This budget recognizes that in order to continue our momentum in creating jobs, we need a sturdy infrastructure of roads and bridges and ports, as well as a highly skilled and well-educated workforce. Over the past five years, we have made an unprecedented investment in our transportation system. And now, with this budget, we can do even more. This budget increases the cap on transportation trust fund spending, enabling us to invest $900 million in projects in fiscal year 2000. <coughs> this money will enable us to move ahead on important goals, including pedestrian safety and the repair of crumbling and unsafe bridges. Let me be clear, this is not a long-term fix. We still need to work together to reauthorize the trust fund before it expires in June of 2000. I look forward to working with Transportation Chairs Alex DeCroach and Andy Cecil on this essential issue. 
In the meantime, we will not be able to do all the projects I outlined when I made my original proposal last spring. But let's not hesitate to jumpstart a key project for the future of our state, construction of the portway. You and I know that our state's economic health depends on our best efforts to keep our ports competitive. Thanks to our delegation on Capitol Hill, we secured $60 million in federal funds to modernize the Port of New York and New Jersey. Let's reap all that we can from that port by making the portway a priority. With this special truck service corridor in place, companies will find distributing their products faster and easier. Our goal should be nothing short than this, to make New Jersey the port of call for the world. We should also set a goal of making our schools world-class, to make our $6 billion investment in public education worth every penny. This budget increases aid to public education by $317 million. Some of this increase will fix the imbalance that existed for years because the formula did not reflect changes in enrollment. Now the money will go where the children are. Speaker Collins has taken the lead in addressing the desperate need for new and renovated schools. Because of his efforts, we have put a total of $82 million aside for new school construction. <laughs> this money will help us carry out our plan to create a $2.6 billion construction fund for the Abbott districts and spend as much as $2.7 billion to share the cost of school construction with other districts in the state. And because children should come to class hungry for knowledge, not for food, we are including funds in this budget to give 22,000 more needy students a school breakfast. This budget truly reflects our commitment to children. Fully one-third of it is dedicated to education. No other administration or legislature has ever committed so much of the state's resources to our schools. With this budget, our billion-dollar commitment to higher education also grows. I am proposing a $70 million five-point plan for keeping college affordable. First. This budget proposal makes the second installment on my pledge to our county colleges by again increasing their operating aid by $12 million. And I call on them. <laughs> and I call on them to continue to hold the line on tuition. Next. This budget increases aid to our independent colleges and universities, which play a key role in educating New Jersey students. Third, my plan helps families pay for college by adding a total of $11 million to our tuition aid grant and outstanding scholars recruitment grant programs. And as we do, I want to applaud the support for TAG shown by this legislature, in particular, Senators Joe Carillas and Winona Lippman, and Assemblymen Dave Wolf and Joe Malone. <laughs> the fourth point of my plan responds to what college presidents, public and independent, told me was their number one priority. It supports our $550 million bond program for deferred maintenance and other capital projects on their campuses. What will that mean to these institutions? Well, at Kane University, they will be adding more classrooms. UMDNJ will use the bond to establish a child health institute. And Monmouth University will renovate its library. Finally, I propose we increase operating aid for our senior public and research institutions by 3.5%, more than double the rate of inflation. This substantial increase, when added to our half-billion-dollar capital program and full funding for fringe benefits, should enable them to meet every family's priority, a tuition they can afford. I 
I've talked a lot today about setting priorities, about recognizing that how we spend our public dollars define the values that we share as a state. So this budget invests in our families, our schools, and our environment. It provides for healthy bodies, good roads, and a solid economy. This budget also funds another priority we share, making New Jersey a beacon of excellence in the arts. We know the arts are an integral part of any civilized society and every proud state. We know they play a significant part in our tourism, our second largest industry. What's more, we've seen them breathe new economic life into cities like Newark and New Brunswick. And as proved by the gospel singers you heard earlier, the arts can truly stir the heart. I'm proud to announce my pledge to achieve a level of funding for the arts that honors our commitment to access and excellence. So with this budget, I am calling for a $3 million increase for cultural projects funded by the process we've established through the State Council on the Arts. <laughs> and let me declare today that with your help, we will answer the arts community's call for 20 by 2,000 by increasing state arts funding to an annual total of $20 million by July of next year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is my budget proposal for fiscal year 2000. I look forward to working with Senate President DeFrancesco and Speaker Collins, Appropriations Chairs Bob Littell and Rich Bagger, with Democrat leaders Dick Cody and Joe Doria, and with all the members of this legislature. Together, we can make this budget a reality and give our citizens the state government that they deserve. Citizens of New Jersey, it's been said that budgeting is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. With this budget, we're sending your money where it belongs in safe streets and healthy communities, in thriving cities and rolling meadows, in classrooms that inspire and concert halls that enthrall. Most importantly, we're sending your money back into your pockets. That's our number one priority. This budget is centered on the belief that you deserve property tax relief. The next step is up to you. Through your vigilance, through your insistence on accountability and creativity, you can help government at every level serve you better. As a first step, I invite you to examine our spending plan, which we are posting on the state website and in libraries around our state. I think you will find that it's a document which reflects the values we all share. This budget moves us into the 21st century. It reflects where we've been and where we're headed. It addresses the needs of families from South Jersey to North Jersey, from the Delaware to the Atlantic. It speaks to the children of men and women from all walks of life and from every income level. This is a spending plan that funds the people's priorities. It's a document that mirrors our hopes and dreams. And it's a vision of a New Jersey that we are all truly proud to call home. Thank you very much. Governor Whitman shaking hands with the Assembly Speaker as she receives a standing ovation for her budget address. The Governor outlined the priorities she sees in this $19.2 billion spending plan for fiscal year 2000, which begins July the 1st. The governor said our highest priority in this legislative session must be property tax relief. She also called for property tax reform, calling for citizens to get involved in reducing the number of governmental units that are costing New Jersey property taxpayers so much money. She called for more regionalization among the localities, local governments, school districts. She also promised to put some of this billion dollars in extra spending in a number of places, starting with state parks and urban park development, calling for $10 million a year to create new urban parks. She called for $10 million in new urban programs for the cities themselves to attract middle-income people into the cities. 
She highlighted youth violence initiatives in this address. She was very strong on anti-tobacco initiatives. The state is about to get a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars next year from the recent tobacco settlement. The governor, sounding almost like President Clinton, uh, embraced the idea of ending the reliance on cigarettes, the use of cigarettes. She called upon a young student who'd won an essay contest to read from that anti-smoking essay. The governor also highlighted, highlighted welfare, developmental disabilities, port development, the Transportation Trust Fund, school aid, higher education, and she's increasing aid to the arts by $3 million in this budget. That wraps it up from here. Back to you, Kent. We'll be back with legislative response to the governor's speech shortly. All right, Michael, and we will rejoin you at that time. Turning now to our political insiders, Roger Bodman and Jim McQueenie. Roger, to begin with you, do you think that this will be uh, kind of clear sailing for the legislature? Oh, I would absolutely think so, Kent. You know, the governor just used the words uh, balanced and ambitious to describe this budget. I would add the word courageous in, in, in the fact that she really took on, and uh, for the first time of, of any governor I can truly remember, this whole basic underlying core of the property tax problem. She, she herself admits that, that this is a relief program, the $200 million, uh, that's the first installment on a property tax relief program, but that the underlying core is, is, is this proliferation of government we have in this state, and she called upon the people to, to look into that and address it and provided incentives for mayors to, to uh, come together with consolidation plans for services and the like. I think that's courageous. She deserves uh, deserves a, a great amount of applause for that initiative. On the other side of the aisle, Jim, well, anything to quibble about? Well, uh, not so much to quibble. It was a good speech in, in good times and it's a generous budget with a generous economy. Uh, but to pick up on Roger, Roger's point, because it's, it's going to be interesting to see how you get at the root of reform on uh, overlapping municipal services and the like. There may be a point in time here in government, uh, it used to be uh, county government if you said, hey, county government, you, you, you take the responsibility. They're all run by freeholders and nobodies, frankly, and you know, who do you blame if it doesn't work? Where's the accountability? Well, now you have four counties that have county executives, uh, essentially uh, little governors uh, of their counties, Bergen, uh, Essex, Hudson, Atlantic, uh, Mercer. Uh, so uh, you have the very big counties that would have somebody accountable for if these efficiencies uh, are put in place or they fail to be put in place. So uh, it's less of a risk now, still laudable, less of a risk to go back to the counties perhaps and say, you people figure out how it's done efficiently to save the taxpayer dollars. And, and frankly, I'm not going to suffer if it fails. You will. And you know what? That's not a bad deal, and that's a fair deal in politics. The people closest to it should be held most accountable and most responsible for trying to put a new program how, in place. How do you go out and sell this, though, uh, when, when it's been historic in New Jersey? Uh, 611 municipalities, uh, each with, with, with home rule. Well, I, well, as I mentioned b before the governor's speech, Ken, obviously we've had this long-term love affair with home rule, and it is, it is politically sacrosanct to have, have it. And, and, and the governor isn't calling for, for an abolition of towns or anything of that. She's, she's calling for consolidation of services. She, she lauded four Hudson County mayors that came together on a fire district. She mentioned there was one county in this state that uh, had more fire trucks than, than New York City as a whole, though the less than half or whatever the population. Um, she's addressing these problems on, 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 a, on, a, on a very appropriate level and calling upon the mayors and those that truly raise those taxes, decide how much they're going to be, set the tax rates, if you will, and, and, and spend that money and calling upon them to take advantage of these new state programs and incentives for consolidation of services. Actually, it's 567 great. municipalities and yes. 611 school in districts. Fact, it is. But, but also, Kent, you know, this budget, you know, Jim talks about the great economy. In fact, we have a great economy, but the, 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 the fiscal constraint that this governor has shown over her six budget years uh, has been somewhat extraordinary, about 3.6% average growth over her six years uh, of, of, of her governorship as compared to her immediate predecessor and even, even former Republican governors that have been more than double that rate. The average budget increase in the floor years was 6.3%, in the Kane years was plus or minus 10%, so she's shown tremendous fiscal constraint as well as addressing some of these tremendous needs our state well, has. Uh, but, not, but not beneath hiding some of the actual costs like that required a 2.8 billion dollars in borrowing that could have come off the state line. 
put into a closet somewhere a couple of years ago and bonded out to Wall Street and paid but Jim, I would point in out decades you, from now, Roger. I would Roger, point out so. to you that the, 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 the truth of the matter is the fact that the general obligation level of the state has been roughly 3% of the total budget for the last 10 years. And this budget, in fact, the, the general obligation debt is about 2.7%. So, so, so the, 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 the line, if you will, of borrowing has remained steady as a percentage of the budget as a whole. The governor says that you borrow that kind of money to pay for capital expenses, and she defends her move to be able to do that for long-term expenses in the state. Well, before you go, though, saying that it's so tidy and orderly like this, there are, there are big chunks of obligations, though, that are offline and unseen to people in the out years, and I don't think uh, uh, even with the laudable uh, distribution of money, and that's essentially what this budget is because of good times, it's a distribution of the overflow. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, Roger mentioned Christy Whitman, the fiscal conservative. Can she still sell herself as, as a fiscal conservative with, uh, with a, a roughly just under 5% increase in the budget, the hiring of more state employees, expanding well, again, on government? Well, that's the point I was just trying to make, Kent. You know, I mean, a budget is, is a system of priorities. And, and, and this, is, this has been, uh, that's why I cited the statistics I just mentioned in terms of the average of 3.6. My calculation, it's less than 4% that this budget goes up with, without the benefit of a calculator on the hand. I might add. But the point is, is that, that she, in fact, can, can, can remain and is a, a true fiscal conservative. This is a very modest increase on a percentage basis, but particularly as compared yeah. to, to her immediate predecessors, yeah. including all the way back Roger, to the You're still talking about $19 billion uh, budget uh, 19, in size, uh, which people understand, 19 point, what's past point, 19, point, uh, uh, point 19 billion. billion. Um, and she quoted Dorothy Parker, but she didn't use another phrase about consumption, whether it's consumption of dollars or liquor, that uh, Dorothy Parker's phrase, uh, candy's dandy, but liquor's quicker, uh, was the other <laughs> phrase that's often used, not in the budget, but uh, you know that's consuming a lot of dollars at 19 billion. And uh, when you look at the chart, but keep, uh, keep in we're mind, going Jim, up. Keep in mind that this has a 750 million dollar surplus. This budget last year was 700 million. This one's 750 million. Rainy day fund has more money than ever. So she's not spending all the money. There's a lot set aside for the future. And and again, that's why she can can utilize justifiably the phrase fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. All right. We seem to agree it's a good budget, a sound budget, and um, we're going to take a break in our coverage of the Governor Whitman's budget address, and we'll be back with more legislative budget officers about the governor's spending plan, and we'll bring that to you shortly, so stay with us. This is an NJN News special report. Governor Whitman's budget message to the state legislature. Hello, I'm Kent Manahan, and welcome back to our coverage of Governor Whitman's budget message. The governor just completed her address to a joint session of the state legislature a few minutes ago. We're going to go back to the assembly chambers at the state house and rejoin our NJN senior political correspondent, Michael Aaron, who is standing by with the legislative budget officers. Michael? That's right, Ken. I'm here with two Democrats and two Republicans. Uh, the two Democrats are Senator Bernard Kenny of Hoboken, Assemblyman Joe Charles of Jersey City. The Republicans are Senator Bob Littell of Franklin Township, Sussex County, and Assemblyman Rich Bagger of Westfield. Let me start with Senator Littell, the senior member of this group. You came up here and said uh, we could pass this budget this afternoon. Is it that, uh, that wonderful a budget? It's a great budget. No new taxes, no layoffs. No privatization, lots of new programs for education, higher education, primary and secondary education, provides uh, more state troopers to put on the highway and uh, protect us from crime, has lots of uh, great things in it. I think uh, it's the best budget I've seen in a lot of years. Best budget he's seen in a lot of years, Senator. How about you? Certainly since Governor Whitman became governor. Uh, my colleagues are sounding more and more like Democrats. What a difference an election uh, makes. 1997 was a squeaker of an election. Republicans have obviously gone back to the drawing board, revamping their strategy, and they're addressing Democratic issues, uh, very clearly trying to get back to the mainstream of New Jersey life. So to that extent, I applaud it. Someone in Bagger, your initial reaction to the budget? 
Well, the governor's hit all the bases, and in my book, that makes it a home run. She's made uh, good, and, and on her campaign commitment in 1997 to have a major new initiative for property tax relief. That was announced in the State of the State message. It's funded in this budget. We also cut taxes again by exempting over 200,000 low-income New Jerseyans from the income tax altogether, as well as continue a property tax freeze for low-income seniors. Uh, so we're cutting taxes, property tax relief, and meeting a, a wide array of spending needs for the, for the state in this budget plan the governor presented today. Three kudos, Assemblyman. You want to make it four? No, I don't, because the, there's more rhetoric of property tax relief than there is substance. Uh, as I view the budget, we have, uh, following a quote of hers from the speech, going back into the pocketbooks of the taxpayers, we have $120 only. But that's more than offset by the school property increases that suburban districts and urban districts will uh, experience, and also more than offset by the increases in property taxes of a municipal nature in both urban and suburban well, districts. The governor is saying that she is putting $300 million more into school aid and upping municipal aid, you think she should put even more into those categories? Uh, of course, because that amount of money, the amount that she's proposing putting into first municipal aid, that's flat. We get about $6 million more, $10 million if you stretch it. That's not going to keep up with the increased cost of operating municipalities. The, on the uh, school side, the $300 million does not provide the kind of funding that the suburban districts will need to keep up with the expenses. So we're not getting property tax relief. We're getting some additional money, but not the kind of monies that will really make a difference. $120 doesn't do it. Which Republican wants to respond to that? Not well, well, this this year's uh, state budget has a greater percentage of the state budget going to public education than any budget in the state's uh, history. We now have uh, well over $5 billion in direct state aid to schools. I'm particularly pleased that Governor Whitman has called for a full funding of school aid based upon current enrollment, something very important to growing districts in the state, particularly in the suburban areas. Someone with Charles said that the suburban districts aren't going to get what they need to uh, keep up with their rising costs. You represent suburban areas, uh, Union County. Uh, is he right? Well, as Assemblyman Charles uh, knows, the uh, state uh, Supreme Court has been involved in that issue for, uh, for a number of uh, years and has ordered that 200 uh, suburban uh, districts in New Jersey aren't entitled to minimum aid for education at, at all. Uh, but, but, but that being said, for both the, the urban districts and the, the middle income districts, we have increasing aid based upon enrollment. Uh, we're complying with the, uh, the Abbott uh, decision. And very importantly, we have a new initiative for school construction uh, that I think is going to ultimately uh, uh, benefit all the school districts in this state. Uh, school construction, the governor called for $82 million to be put towards school construction, but then in her own words said this is a uh, $5.3 billion problem. Is there enough money for school construction here, Senator? Well, one of the issues that the governor's budget raises, and I want to stress again, we've lost a lot of time. Five years we've had the rhetoric that uh, the governor and the Republicans are not responsible for property taxes, are not responsible for the schools. Now they're starting to acknowledge obligations, but we've lost five years. Uh, what's happening in this budget is the governor is supporting and endorsing a lot of costs that are going to come due after she's out of office. We calculated nearly $8 billion worth of costs. And what we have to do in this budget, I'm sure Joe Charles is going to do it on the assembly side, is to really examine uh, how we're going to pay for these things. Are we going to do it through more borrowing, more taxes? Well, I hear, excuse me, I hear you Democrats uh, saying she's not doing enough to offset property taxes and she's spending too much future dollars. Are you trying to have it both ways here? No, well, we, well, I'm saying that we should have started this a long time ago and we could have approached it in a reasonable manner. Uh, the property tax relief that the governor's office has offered needs to be looked at in the budget process over the next couple of months. There's a lot to this rebate that we have questions about. So that's not a done deal, at least not on our side. We want to look at it and see whether it's the best way to really offer property tax relief and to start heading into property tax reform. May, may I say something, too, on the uh, school aid? Uh, support of the state to uh, public school education. I came to this legislature a couple of years ago, and at, at that time the budget was $5.4 billion my first year here. Each and every year since I've been here, uh, the proportion of the budget that's gone to public education has been approximately one-third. So when you say that she's spending one-third on support of public education, that's not new. That's as old as I am in terms of my tenure here in the legislature. That goes back a number of years. Senator Littell, uh, this budget is $1 billion greater than uh, the current year budget. 
And I heard Kent Manahan a little while ago uh, ask our experts, Roger Bodman and Jim McQueenie, whether this is really a, a fiscal conservative anymore or not. Uh, what's your view on that question? Well, you got to remember the economy is strong. More people are working than ever. Uh, unemployment's down, employment's up, welfare's down. It's okay to loosen the belt then. No, you're, you're talking about why is there so much money? There's so much money because more people are working. And when you have more people working, you have more people paying taxes. Obviously, the governor's trying to apply the money where she thinks it fits right and fits best. And she's doing that in, in a very sensible way because she wants to return a lot of it to the people that paid it. If I can add, of the billion dollars in new spending, I calculated about 600 million of it is going to, uh, to tax relief. Uh, so, uh, so that's where the, uh, the spending increase uh, comes from, by offsetting the school tax, uh, lowering the income tax on, the, on, on lower income people. The governor said it's not just about property tax relief, it's about property tax reform. And she once again called on the citizens of the state and local officials to really get together and do something to eliminate all the jurisdictions we have in this state. Senator Littell, you come from a rural part of the state. Uh, how is that call going to be received in Sussex County uh, to eliminate the numbers of town governments and school districts? Well, we've tried it. In my own hometown of Franklin Borough and Hardison Township uh, did a study, and it was unanimous when they got done that they should do shared services, which they're doing and have been doing for several years. Uh, but they decided the merger of the two municipalities was incompatible. It ran up, it ran up against home rule then? Is that what you're saying? It's not, it's not realistic to think that the towns and school districts are going to want to consolidate? No, it didn't run up against uh, home rule. What it ran up against was practicality. The uh, two police departments had different unions. The uh, teacher salaries were different in the two communities. A lot of things like that that are just basic. So is it a pipe dream of governors to think that local governments will merge in New Jersey? Well, I think it's very difficult. Princeton Borough and Princeton Township tried it twice and failed both times. I think if you examine the uh, situation, you'll find that shared services are a good start, and when you get beyond that, uh, you may be able to get some municipalities and some school districts to merge. Uh, you gentlemen both come from Hudson County. Uh, the governor highlighted urban initiatives today. Uh, she talked about $10 million more million per year to create urban parks and a $10 million initiative, a two-pronged initiative to uh, draw more middle-class people into uh, urban homes. Your, uh, your reaction to her stress in the speech on urban needs? Well, um, open space, um, fair allocation of open space resources not present in her proposal. She talks about $10 million to go to urban and I take it suburban parks. I'm not sure whether, I think both are included. I think that that's not enough for our suburban and urban parks. We're talking in the first year under the program of almost $200 million going into that program. 98 million that's dedicated, 100 million in bonds. In the first year of that 98 million that's dedicated, it's not going, all of that is not going to be needed to pay off the bonds. So we're going to have a lot of money in the first year for this program. $10 million just going to urban parks is not enough. On the urban initiative, uh, you know, it's clever language that was used in the budget where she represented that there was a billion dollars in urban initiative. That's not true. This year, uh, budget had a $10 million uh, program in it, and that's how much it has been in the prior budgets of this government, about $10 million per year. So it's not a billion dollars, and the $10 billion program is something that's nice but it just doesn't get it. It does not provide the kind of programs that we need. you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I, uh, I think we have to do much better in urban New Jersey. Urban New Jersey is a success story today. Many of our municipalities and cities are turning around. Jersey City, Hudson County, uh, Newark, and uh, Patterson. A lot of good things are happening. And my feeling is that when you have an economic engine like urban New Jersey is, you've got to invest in it. And I really think we should be doing much better than the governor's suggesting. Assemblyman Bagger, your response? We heard today from a governor who represents all the people of uh, New Jersey, and I believe there were some very exciting uh, new initiatives for the, the cities. Both these, the general, these Democrats say it's not enough. Well, well that's what we're going to work with them on in the, in the committee, but it, it's, it's not just the, the urban residence program she spoke of. We heard of health initiatives today uh, targeted at problems of public health in our, uh, our, our cities, which is, I think, is a fabulous uh, initiative. Using some of the tobacco money for that. Yeah, I thought that was uh, exactly 
exactly uh, uh, one of the most uh, exciting initiatives in uh, this speech today, a long-term uh, effort to really improve uh, public health in, in this state by focusing on the needs of children. Was anybody... Make a reaction yeah. to that, yeah. I mean, her programs. I think that the challenge for this budget uh, committees, this session, is to examine really these programs and whether or not they're designed to be effective in during the course of the bu budget year. I think of the Kids Care Program. We budgeted, what, $48 million or so last year with the understanding that there was 100,000 uninsured children. At the end of the year, we have insured 20,000. Whatever happened to the other 80,000, why are we lapsing monies? Are these programs uh, just sound good programs, or is there an intent to really implement these programs? Put some, some commitment and some uh, research and effort into making them work. Was anybody here struck by the governor's uh, strong anti-tobacco uh, rhetoric today? I was. I, I wonder if anybody else here was. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard her really uh, call for an end to smoking across the board to the extent that she did today. Am I the only one here who, saw, who heard that? I, 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 I wouldn't say I was struck by it, but I think it was the part of the speech that the governor was most emotionally involved in, for, for sure. And uh, you could tell by the reaction that the legislature seemed to be very supportive. There were, there were, you want to say something? I, just, I think it ref reflects that the tobacco uh, uh, settlement is reimbursing the state for the cost consequences of tobacco-related illnesses, and now that we're receiving the funds, we have a real opportunity and a real commitment we're making to use those funds to reduce smoking, and the governor made that very, very clear today. Let me uh, tick off some of the other things she talked about. Youth violence, um, uh, welfare, cutting the welfare caseload developmental disabilities, the Transportation Trust Fund, improving the port of New York and New Jersey, school construction, higher education, and more money for the arts. Senator Littell, pick one and uh, tell us how you feel about it. Transportation Trust Fund. If you don't have a good infrastructure to move people and goods and services, you don't have anything. New Jersey's got a great highway system. We need to make it better. And she proposed uh, making it better or extending the trust fund last year by hiking the gasoline tax by five cents. The legislature was cool to that proposal. Uh, you have any thoughts? And, and even this uh, proposal today didn't involve any long-term funding. This was just to lift the cap for this one year from $700 million worth of spending to $900 million. You have any thoughts on whether we need to hike the gasoline tax to extend that trust fund on into the next century? I don't think there'll be any effort to hike the gasoline tax. I think there's uh, ample money in the budget. I think we need to make sure that the uh, system works. I think our commitment to raise the, uh, the cap level by uh, 200 million will make a substantial dent in the backlog of bridges and uh, roads that need attention. No tax hikes for transportation. The Democratic view on that? Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd like to. Go ahead, Bernie. Um, I supported it uh, last year. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the transportation uh, tax on gasoline, and I won't go into the reasons for it. I supported it, and I would just want to say that we're incurring some major liabilities in this budget, and ongoing there's some big ones looming. I'm talking about multi-billion dollar liabilities. So we're going to have to have a way to fund the Transportation Trust Fund and other things as we go down the road. You take, no, you take, let's, let's have a last word from everybody. Uh, you, you want that to be your last word, or you want to say something else? That's fine. Okay. Some women? Uh, phase in debts, uh, other legislatures, other governors, future taxpayers pay the bill. I think that's how you characterize uh, this governor's proposed budget. We in the legislature have an obligation to really do right by our property taxpayers and make it real this year rather than just making it appear that way. Too much debt, I hear. A last word. A strong economy in New Jersey, uh, good revenues, uh, leading to a good budget that meets the needs of our state, including including tax relief, and we'll be working together over the next few months to, to really fine-tune some excellent proposals. Too much debt, say the Democrats. A last word from you. Well, I don't think there's too much debt. We'll keep an eye on it. Uh, the last word is it is a great budget, and we're going to pass it, and we're going to make sure that the people in the state of New Jersey get what they want, need, and deserve. All right, Senator Robert Littell, Assemblyman Rich Bagger, Assemblyman Joe Charles, Senator Bernard Kenny. thank you very much. Legislative hearings on this budget will begin this spring. The budget has to be passed, approved, signed by June 30th at midnight. It's for fiscal year 2000. That has an interesting ring to it. This is Michael Aaron reporting in the assembly chamber. Back to you, Ken.
Thank you, Michael. And of course, we'll be following the budget process in the coming months. And that concludes our coverage of Governor Whitman's budget message. I'm Kent Manahan. For Roger Bodman, Jim McQueenie, and the entire NJN News team, thank you for being with us this afternoon.